My name is Esther Everett, I'm an architect by profession and for the last five years I have been leading projects um, in the public sector linked to the legacy of the London 2012 Olympics. I lead a team at what is called the London Legacy Development Corporation, shortened as LLDC and I'll refer to it as LLDC otherwise I'll be saying that name too many times. Um, and the team that I lead manage a range of master planning, infrastructure, park, landscape and public realm projects. So what does the London Legacy Development Corporation do? So the first thing that we are is that we are a planning authority. So um, there is a map there, and I'll use this map several times as a background. Um, you can see the River Thames at the, at the bottom. This area is called the Lower Lee Valley, and the Lee River is um, the river that runs through what is called the Lower Lee Valley. So we are a planning authority, so within that black line, every planning application, whether it's for a small house extension or whether it's for a large um, project, comes to colleagues in, my, um, in, our, in our department um, who assess those applications. We also have defined a number of um, centres. The largest there is the um, Metropolitan Centre which is well underway um, and is a place called Stratford. The other areas are neighbourhood centres, um, and those are the areas which we're concentrating on now. So the LLDC, we um, an estate manager. We um, manage what is there in outline in green, which is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, which is a visitor destination. We're an events promoter as well, so we facilitate events on that park. We're also a landowner and a developer, so all the land there in yellow and in orange and in red is all land that we own, and we own that land and we use it to kickstart regeneration and to set standards for that development. So overall, putting these things together, um, we are a regeneration agency and we will use our planning powers and our um, land ownership um, and the, the park as a way of regenerating this part of East London. Just one thing to note there is that the dotted line divides the local authority boundaries, so we're working within four different local authority boundaries which presents its own problems. So just quickly, running from um, 2005, and I'll show, I'll show three of these. This is the London A to Z, so it's the... Um, map by which many people orientate themselves and use to um, navigate London. This is in 2005. The white areas show um, industrial, uh, industrial land, and there has been a change already to this map over the last decade through a major infrastructural change of delivering the Olympics through to um, new neighbourhoods, and you can see those white spaces um, from now onwards, this map is showing how um, those will be built out with new neighbourhoods connected to the old. So the first case study that I want to talk through is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. This is a, um, a new park which celebrates the river that runs through it. And the next stage of this is the development of neighbourhoods around that park. So the context... London is growing eastwards. Um, the Olympic Park area and its surroundings is a focus of a rapid growth. 25% of London's housing um, is expected to be in this eastward area. That's a figure from 2012, and some of it has already started to be delivered. It's a strategically well-connected place. So in terms of transport infrastructure, um, the, the metropolitan centre within the Lower Lee Valley is Stratford, and it is connected by London Underground, by um, three underground lines, by an overground line, by a DLR system, by bus routes, and soon to be by Crossrail, which will start to open from um, next year. No, two years, 2018. 
So the opportunity of the Olympics was to harness the potential of the Games. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's obviously something that doesn't come around um, often. But this little diagram just shows that right from the beginning of the story of the Games, um, we were looking to um, position the River Lee on the map and to make that the focus of the legacy. So in terms of recent history, I'm just going to run through the story of the Games very quickly. So in, in 2005, the win to London was announced against Paris, a very exciting time. The area which is defined um, as the site that was needed to deliver that, you can see there the river running through it, a red line boundary. This was an area which needed to be um, CPO'd, so compulsory purchased various parts of um, private land within that to deliver the games. And this was what it was like then. So a place of contamination and waste, it was a dumping ground. So for 100 years, the Lower Lake Lee Valley was not a place that many Londoners frequented. It was um, a dumping ground. It looked pretty much like this. This is a very, a very famous picture that's been used many times, so it's quite low resolution here, but this is called Fridge Mountain. It's a place where all the fridges were dumped. And critically here, the, public, the, the waterfront was not public. It's a private. The waterways were neglected, so amazing potential. And as you know, nature has a you know, way of healing itself quickly. So first thing was to take, these, um, to take this waste out of the waterways. And, of course, a poor quality infrastructure, so no sort of proper roads, pavements, public realm. But in a primary location, so you can see the site was just by Canary Wharf. So the first piece of work that was done was to put together an organisation called the Olympic Delivery Authority, named, called the ODA. Um, and that organisation was... Um, put in place to secure the land from individuals, um, not necessarily um, without opposition, of course. Um, residents, including traveller families, were needed to be relocated, and businesses um, found new homes. Overall, it was a successful relocation. The site then closed down, so big change in the landscape because around that red line was suddenly uh, no-go zone, so a more, even more of a fragmentation in the urban fabric. The second job of the Olympic Delivery Authority was to remediate contaminated land and to bury all the power lines. So the, there were overground, overhead power lines in this area which were all put underground. It was a huge task and effectively took up the majority of the construction period of the Games. By 2010, the um, the new sort of park was starting to emerge. The main landmark venues for the Games were um, under construction, mostly watertight. And in 2011, it was the um, finishing touches. 2012, this is some images of the Games itself. You can see the new parkland that's been opened up. A huge investment in the landscape in reintroducing natural species that had previously um, left the valley due to the contamination and the provision of a temporary platform within that park to accommodate the hundreds of thousands of visitors during the games. And the river itself was a focus to the games and that's a pavilion that sits, sets, a temporary pavilion that sat on the river within the new parkland. So I'm just going to talk about the design and the structure of the park. The Games Time Plan for 2012, so the second organisation um, of interest is called LOCOG. Um, they're the organising committee that put on the Games. So in a way the ODA, the Olympic Delivery Authority, built the theatre and the um, LOCOG then put on the games within that theatre. And you can see here that the, the venues are all centred within the centre of the site. The yellow beige areas are what were the back of house, a huge amount of back of house area 
was needed to accommodate the athletes, um, media um, and all the support services needed to put on a Games. The plan was always to retain a number of landmark venues, so the stadium there in the south, the aquatics designed by Zaha Hadid, the um, velodrome designed by Hopkins Architects and the copper box which is the square in the middle of the site which was designed by Make um, and which hosts now um, basketball and it's a multi-use game centre. But importantly as the design, these landmarks set up a series of views between them and views that are cross and um, knitting, cr crossing the river itself. So the river becomes central to that. Those views then set out a line of development edge, and that development edge, edge is the line which new development, new housing will be, will be following, and we're starting to build out that housing now. So after the Games, so the Games in a way were almost just a moment in what we're seeing in the transformation of this area. Um, the organisation that I'm part of took over post-Games. So we took over the site in 2012 um, after LOCOG had left, taken all of the temporary venues down. And we are responsible for delivering the legacy. So those areas that were in yellow before which were back of house, now become grey areas and now become the development platforms for future housing. And this is an illustration of how that master plan might be built out um, with five new neighbourhoods, Chobham Manor, which is the first, which is now currently on site, Eastwick and Sweetwater, which is the second, originally due to be complete six years later than we now envisage. We brought that forward because of the market in London. And to two final um, areas in the south, Marshcape Wharf and Pudding Mill, which are later on in the plan. So just to recap on the structure, a very, very simple structure, where the back of house, um, where, where the, the Olympics kind of turned itself in towards the river, um, and the back of house turned itself out um, to the back, basically, of the surrounding communities and the legacy where those developments um, start to open up the river to the surrounding communities. A fantastic um, you know, identity of the rec and a recognition of um, engineering legacy on the site and how that provides a certain character that we wish to retain. There have been many factories um, over the past 200 years based in the area and there's a long history particularly of product innovation. And this is something that I've always been particularly interested in. It's the, type, the topography of the site, which is of three levels. There's the lower level of the river. There's an intermediate level with the urban canal network. And then there's the upper level of the city terrace walk. And we've always thought that the success of this um, park and the reintegration of the river into the city is negotiating those three levels and enabling um, good connections between them. So what have we been doing? We've been creating three unique parks as a setting for future development. And, and we started off with a sort of big visioning exercise where we all sat in um, a room and we thought we're going to inherit this huge concrete mass um, which will not be appropriate for um, a local park. We'll never have those hundreds of thousands of visitors every day. We'll have a much smaller um, catchment area of maybe 10, maybe up to 70,000 um, people. And what, what kind of a park do we need to deliver? And looking at the particular characteristics of the area, we came to the conclusion that three distinct park areas were appropriate. In the north, a river valley with a wetland habitat. And to enhance that and to ensure that it's visited and um, appropriate, um, to create a new visitor center which has a cafe, which has the facilities that you need of toilets, basic things like that, 
but also a community room which can be hired out and used by local communities and schools, as well as hired out for things like weddings. When we also um, were obliged through planning to provide a um, playground, which was originally a very small playground, but we realised that the potential here was to create something outstanding and we were lucky to get a million pounds from the Marathon Trust, which enabled us to create one of the biggest and best playgrounds in the UK. There's an image there in the top right-hand corner, um, but it's all natural play and defies most um, standards um, of safety in a controlled way. We've also been working with smaller architects, not, not only the Zahas and um, the Hopkins of London, but with small emerging architects. And we ran an international competition for this particular project, North Park, Park and Hub, and it was a small architectural practice of five people called Erect who won that. They did a great job. In the south, it's very different. It's a hard landscape. Um, and it's, um, it, kind of, it sits alongside the river, but it's um, designed for events, and it's designed to sit within these really quite big um, pieces of structure. This is it. This delivered, um, opened in 2014, and it was designed by James Corner Field Operations, who um, delivered the High Line in New York. Again, we ran an international competition, design competition for this. And the last of the parks sits on the western edge and critical to connecting back to the rest of the city of London, um, a, a canal park which responds to the individual areas that it crosses. Um, this has just been finished on site. You can see that fence there. It's to protect the grass this summer, but the idea is that that is not a fence, that it is open access from the river edge. And just very briefly on the developments that are coming forward, these have all been de designed as family-led um, developments, so three-plus bedrooms. There's an awful lot of one- and two-bedroomed um, housing types in London, particularly apartment blocks, and this was about creating a family-led neighbourhood. That's a, a visualisation of it in the foreground the higher blocks in the background are not part of our site. That's the um, old, the athlete, athlete's village, which was delivered separately. And that's the construction site now. And amazingly, apparently, the first residents will be in there by December. Interestingly, this is a very complex political landscape. This is not straightforward. It's not a situation where we decide and it happens. This is a complex political landscape. That's probably only half of the organisations involved in the area. Um, but we're working across this landscape. And I particularly like these, this image, which is a plan of Sir Christopher Wren for the rebuilding of the city, the old city of London, after the Great Fire of 1666. This was, this was the planned vision. And this is actually what's been built. And I think this is a good very good lesson in um, master planning that things don't always end up as you expect them to.